Alliteration is always appreciated, unless applied awkwardly. If you don't know what alliteration is, it's using words that start with the same letter close together in a sentence. Like, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. But it can be as simple as KFC Double Down. You will be sick of it by the time Episode 3 of Masters of the Universe Revolution is over. Seriously, it's every second sentence. And Hordak basically cannot open his mouth without succumbing to the lure of his one weakness. Just a quick reminder that seriously sexy super studs subscribe soon. This episode takes a bit of a backwards step. We're basically following up on all of the plot points that were started in the episode 2 of Masters of the Universe Revolution. Hordak is still on approach to Eternia, which he's already half conquered by the way. Teela is still working with Evelyn to collect the powers of the Four Towers. Duncan and Orko are off visiting an old friend. He-Man is sent on a wild goose chase by Kaldor. In fact, He-Man does nothing of value in this entire episode. There's a bit of a continuity error with Kaldor's crown, although considering his entire appearance is an illusion, it seems a weird plot point in the end. I did not enjoy this episode beyond the introduction of Orko's new best friend. That was a bit of a giggle. I'd give episode 3 of Masters of the Universe Revolution a 4 out of 10. The story had not gripped me so far this season with characters doing stupid things and the plot being led more by convenience than any real structure. This episode was very disjointed. In 20 minutes of runtime, there is at least 5 separate plot lines. We're talking 4 minutes each. Animation is still really good. The music even seems to be reminiscent of the tracks from the 1980s cartoon. There were a couple of sound effects in this episode that seemed to be stock effects, which drew my attention far more than I think was intended. A couple of computerized beeps made me think, I've heard that before. The biggest issue with episode 3 is that the big reveal was just a confirmation of what we already knew. The twist being that the ruse was actually the truth. If that's the case, then the entire plan seems to be built on stupidity. But enough jibber jabbering, onto the spoilers. Episode 3 of Masters of the Universe Revolution sees my main man, Stondar, being brought to kneel before Hordak. I just want to say that I always hated the rock people. They were one of those late additions to the original toy line that just felt like Mattel was going to Japanese toy shows and licensing their weird action figures. This scene is just in the show to allow for a quick 3 second snippet of each member of the Horde. Grizzlaw, Man, Tenna and Leech. Leech gives Stondar the big suck and that's the end of him. No big loss. But at least this scene gives us the knowledge that Hordak doesn't do the fighting himself. He hires well. Sorry, I mean, he hires his huge horde of henchmen hastily. Hordak reveals to Skeldor for reasons unknown that Kaldor was a real member of the royal family. Seriously, what was Hordak's point of mentioning that to Skeletor? Purely so he could question his own origin? I did laugh when Skeletor asked, When will I be realized for my superior intellect? Probably when you realize that the word you want is recognized. When will you be recognized for your superior intellect? So Motherboard roughed up Skeletor and caused his brain to unlock the memories of being Kaldor, mere seconds after Hordak reveals that Kaldor was a real person. This is the kind of sloppy writing that I hate. Trey Parker and Matt Stone said that they always write South Park with Thing A happens, and because of that, Thing B happens, and because of that, Thing C happens. Rather than what Masters of the Universe Revolution is doing right now, which is Thing A happens, then thing B happens, and then thing C happens. There's just no cause and effect, and it means that anything could happen at any time. This is the kind of hack writing that allows hack riot tropes like someone falling off a bridge just as the mattress truck drives underneath. It's boring. Kaldor shows Skeletor that he was once Kaldor and lived among the Gar until Hordak came along. Why did Hordak destroy the Gar and not conquer the rest of Eternia? He took Kaldor under his wing to act as the Acolyte, because Hordak can't use magic, only technology. Then why are they kidnapping royal babies and not conquering them like the rest of the planet? He-Man wasn't around back then to save them, it makes no sense. This scene has one of the two things I liked about this episode. One being Orko's new friend, and the other being the stuffed toys of a green tiger and a unicorn in the upset cradles of Adam and Adora. They did it! They said the name of the show! Keldor says that they were never meant to serve, that they were meant to master the universe. Oh my god. Okay, Teela, we get it. Now that you're the snake goddess, every word has to end with an S, so you can get your hiss on. So is this scene meant to be Teela overcoming the urges of the car staff? 
because she's just turned feral and attacked Evelyn with no provocation. Does she just need to get it out of her system? I believe that part of this scene is to put the idea in Teela's mind that she loves He-Man, but that kind of annoys me a bit. He-Man doesn't exist. Adam is who Teela should be in love with. Batman is to Bruce Wayne what He-Man is to Prince Adam. It's his alter ego. Andra gets her balls washed again by Keldor praising her ingenuity to He-Man. How I hate that ugly owl plane. It sickens me to look at it. Why does He-Man not let Keldor know that he sent the power sword off to get worked on by Gwildor in order to cleanse the people of the nanobots? Wait, are those people still infected? Did they round them up to be cleansed or are they just roaming free? Anyway, back to He-Man and Keldor. He-Man has witnessed Keldor saving Eternos first hand and even agreed to hand over rulership to him. So why is he now keeping secrets? What has he done to raise He-Man's suspicions? We know that Keldor is Skeletor, but He-Man has no idea. But if He-Man suspects anything, why does he let Keldor send him away from Eternos, leaving him basically unchecked in the city? Meanwhile, Duncan and Orko have reached their destination. It's the man himself, Wildor. I never would have thought they'd bring him back, but it's funny that they did. He was a symptom of everything that was wrong with the live action movie. New characters that have nothing to do with Masters of the Universe. He was also completely unlikable, but I feel like they kind of lean into that here. So does that mean that Detective Lubick is roaming Eternia somewhere? They should do a quick cameo for him as a police officer. Gwildor is an atheist? No wonder he's so sexy. He better wish someone a good journey. Hey, this show's alright. He-Man and Battlecat are about to go off on another adventure to kill Skeletor. And Andra rocks up and just invites herself. He-Man and Battlecat give each other a bit of the old side eye as if to say, are you going to tell her? This unsufferable turd calling herself Man at Arms is giving me flashbacks to Thor with Valkyrie now being King Valkyrie. She's a queen, always will be. Just make Andra Woman at Arms. It was good enough for Teela. Where are we going, guys? She asks. Yes, guys. Take the hint. Why is He-Man volunteering to go on a mission to fight Skeletor alone? Well, okay, with Battle Cat. Why doesn't he take one of the 200 masters of the universe that have been hanging around like bad smells? Why not take Buzz Off or Rio Bravo or Snout Spout? I always thought his name should have been the other way around. Spout Snout. But at least it's following the theme of this episode. More alliteration. I don't like how the battle armor is just an add-on. She could have just made him a suit of armor. I mean, it becomes like a full breast and back plate anyway. This also raises the implication. Was He-Man always three hits away from dying? Does the battle armor make him more vulnerable due to a lack of mobility? Surely he's been hit before. How did he survive if now three hits means death? So now Kaldor knows about Gwildor and his work on the Power Sword. Then why was He-Man being so coy? God, William Shatner is such a good fit for the voice of Kaldor. And he's doing such a great job. He really gets that schmoozy voice down pat. He sucked Andra into helping him infect the entirety of Eternos with nanobots. The show's making it seem like this is some sort of wild twist, but we already know that Keldor is Skeletor, so of course he's up to no good. Gwildor's going to try to treat magic like music, which can be broken down mathematically and use his science to enhance the sword's power. I think the voice actor for Orko does a great job here. He really shows his disdain for Gwildor. While Kaldor is busy infecting more women than Gene Simmons, He-Man is battling his way to Snake Mountain, through Whiplash and Spycore and Webstore, until he comes across Kaldor's crown. This is another stupid bit of writing. Why not just wear the crown? Why do you have to goad the only person capable of stopping you? Kaldor is acting like a Bond villain. Meanwhile, at Castle Grayskull, some bird is trying to get in. Literally a bird. It looks like Zor or Screech, but they've got no reason to be there, so I have no clue who this is meant to be. Luckily, Teela must have used the same magic used to seal Scareglow in his cave. Oh, it's Motherboard. I didn't know she could turn into a bird, but she can turn into whatever she wants, so why not? Why didn't Keldor inoculate Andra first? She would be the biggest threat to his rule, especially if she sees him without his crown. So Motherboard has taken over Greyskull, and she's monologuing like a lunatic. Seriously, she's alone. If magic is so useless, why do you need to take over Grayskull? And she did it. She did the thing. She said, technology is the master of the universe. She said the name of the show. 
Wait, isn't that the second time this episode? Talk about going back to the well. And of course, He-Man loses his powers and becomes plain old Adam again. Does Teela lose her powers? No, she gains more. The march where Hordak enters Castle Grayskull definitely reminds me of the old score from the 1980s. I love it. One of the few highlights of this show. The Horde troopers bring Adam before Hordak and Skeletor says that he'll be a monkey's uncle. I don't get it. He's Adam's uncle, but where does the monkey part come into it? Is it because he made a monkey of him? Does that rule apply to anyone else that he deceived? Hmm. So unfortunately, it's a 4 out of 10 for Masters of the Universe Revolution Episode 3. Sadly, the show tries too hard to implement twists that we can all see coming a mile away because they're fundamental characteristics of previous iterations of the characters. It would be like trying to build a twist around the fact that Prince Adam is secretly He-Man. We know already, and frankly, we expect it. If he wasn't, it wouldn't exactly be a Masters of the Universe episode. Making Kaldor is Skeletor, the twist, and not just that he's pretending to be Kaldor, is one of the worst decisions I've seen made since Bethesda decided to make a space game. Some ideas are good on the surface, but break down when you try to implement them. The smart thing to do is to scrap the idea, but I guess these creators have invested so much time, effort and money on this fool's errand that it's too late for a course correction. The whole leaving the crown for He-Man to find trick was just an unnecessarily risky strategy and I can't believe Hordak, the master strategist, would ever sign off on it. I still look back at the last episode and wonder why Keldor even stopped the invasion of the Techno Titans. They could have taken Eternia already. Stopping the invasion just delayed it for the sake of the story that the writers had laid out. Motherboard being able to take Castle Grayskull single-handedly was just insulting. How many times have other people, namely Skeletor, tried and failed? And I still can't wrap my head around Hordak's half-conquest of Eternia. What was stopping him from completing the job? With Skeletor by his side, he managed to break into the royal nursery. Is there a more well-guarded place on the entire planet? I'm also ticked off by He-Man being depowered again. That's the hack writer's go-to. It happens to Superman too. He-Man gets depowered and Teela gains even more power. Just like last season. It's like pottery, it rhymes. The only hope is that somehow Adam reveals that the courage to take on the villains was a core part of his character and he doesn't need the power of Grayskull to overcome his adversity. But I'm not holding out hope. Of course, some strong women are going to bail his butt out. It's 2024 after all. With only two episodes left, I don't see Masters of the Universe Revolution redeeming itself. Even the best writers on the planet couldn't write themselves out of the corner that this show has written itself into. A real shame as a competent writer could have so much fun with this universe and its characters. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie, thanks for your time, and have a good one.